Hello, it's Scott Manley here with episode 78 of Interstellar Quest. I am on the surface of Drez, being held vertical by some very tenacious reaction wheels, and of course, gathering as much science as the little moon will offer me. The gravity is so low, you wonder if Drez is a planet at all. It is indeed a planet, it is a dwarf planet. And of course we get our seismometers ready for the imminent uh, impact events. There's no internal movement aside from the impacts of meteors, the needle never moves. Well that will change very soon, we will get some artificial meteors. Okay, review the temperature, what does it tell us? It says the temperature readings are as dull and unremarkable as Drez itself. Moving on, we decide that it is perhaps a bad plan to set up my base on such a steep slope. So I lift off the vehicle and move laterally over the surface, trying to find a place on this moon which is, well, flat enough basically to uh, support this thing without resorting to reaction wheels. I really don't have any topology maps or anything fancy available to me. I could have cross-referenced with uh, something like Kerbal Maps. They do have slope information, but truthfully I just kind of eyeballed it until I found a location. Obviously this probe isn't included, uh, doesn't isn't equipped with eyeballs, which is why it tried to land there and then changed my mind at the last minute. It's kind of <laughs> you can see what I'm doing here. And of course wondering how much of my uh, return fuel I'm using up. I wasn't sure I was going to need to return, but ultimately this was launched if you remember back when version point, uh, 0.22 in fact, back when you really could transmit all the science home given enough time. Anyway, this is one of our artificial meteors falling towards Drez at 10,000 times normal speed until of course I get so close that the the time acceleration limiter kicks in. It is small, it is simple, it is empty, and it is doomed to crash against the dark, dull grey surface of Dreads, providing a flash, a moment of interest in an otherwise unremarkable and uninteresting location. This will now be known as Impact Site 1. Impact recorded, science can now be accessed from one of your accelerometers deployed on this body. So where is the accelerometer? There we go. Collect impact data. Whoa! 400 science. Drez lander probe debris has impacted onto Drez. Well, we have only uh, 10,000 to get, right? That's what we need. We've already unlocked antimatter and... Moving swiftly on, and by swiftly I mean orbital velocity type speeds, we have uh, the science component of this spacecraft coming in. So uh, it has a lab and it has a little uh, unit there. You can see the doors are closed right now, but that will contain a bunch of scientific hardware which is going to be carried on the front of this spacecraft. You can see how the spacecraft is set out. So there's a drive section at the back and there's this uh, shield assembly and then uh, the actual crew areas are up the front on the other side of that thing. We're going to attach some more fuel to the back of it, but right now this is the science lab and everything here. This science lab also comes with particle collectors, because, because of course we're fascinated by the kind of particles we're going to collect. In particular, we really want to collect more of that antimatter. Because you never know where uh, it might be, what it might be useful for. We only need a minuscule amount to run this reactor, but collecting as much of it if we, as we can can only be a good thing. So shifting slightly backwards, we're just trying to keep everything lined up. Moving in at 0.1 meters per second, that is 4 inches per second for you people still speaking Imperial. You people who are still stuck on a measurement system derived from, uh, well, the British Empire, right? And I think we feel the force now pulling us in, and we are docked. The spacecraft is continuing to develop, to develop, starting to look a little cooler. Now, let's see what we've got to do here. First thing I should probably do is ditch this little thing at the front, right? So there is a separatron, or a, like a stack separator in there. And these two things, uh, the two collectors, are like they were strutted to that. So now that's detached. 
we uh, can now roll out my antimatter collectors. Whoa! Yes, don't go so fast. I don't know about you, but that reminds me of like somebody waving their hands in the air at a concert. All, all I can think of now is, is um, oh, cameo, word up, right? Wave your hands in the air like you don't care. Glide by the people as they stop to look and stare. It is actually somewhat appropriate, as uh, this, of course, is gliding over the planet and people are staring at it. But uh, the, the waving of the hand seems to be abating somewhat as I am moving it at only one-tenth of its design speed to let the damping happen. It, you see that it does have solar panels there. We're probably not going to need those, but just in case, it never hurts to have these things. I mean... You know, worst case scenario, if that thing ha is going to explode, we can detach the crew section. And speaking of detaching things, of course, we can dispose of the, the thing that actually brought us up here. I mean, you know, I'm still using chemical rockets because they have great thrust to weight ratios. And it is kind of beautiful. Look at that. What a beautiful flyby. This ship is really starting to look like something, I don't know, amazing. Either that or an amazingly uh, cobbled together mess. Well, whatever this spacecraft thinks, it will bring those thoughts to its fiery doom in the atmosphere as it is disposed of. Another fiery sacrifice to the gods of spaceflight. And similarly, out at Drez, we are sacrificing the second of our fuel tanks in the name of science. Seismic science. Yes. We get more science from this, from the uh, seismometer, whatever it is, right there. Uh, there we go. Yes. Collect impact data, and we get 242.6. That is pretty darn excellent. Start transmitting it, and yeah, we're totally out of electric power. Well, you know, we've got all the data we can get. It's. Uh, I think. It, I think we should probably just get ready to leave, really, because... We can act actually, once we fire up the engine, we will actually start generating power. Okay, everything getting hot, and engine is online. Farewell, Drez. We knew you far too little, but now we have a bounty of science to return to our masters back at the Kerbal Space Center. At least if we can figure out how to retrieve it. Besides, this visit was far more long duration than the the previous space probe that flew by. If you remember it, it uh, literally spent less than 10 seconds close to the planet because we uh, were traveling past it at something like 56 kilometers per second. Okay, so we got to make usual uh, maneuvering to get out of here. We're going to make a plane change to get ourselves lined up with our exit vector here. 161 meters per second we're going to need to uh, put in this thing. Now, I don't actually have a clue how much uh, Delta V is left because I didn't actually push the button to look in the, the flight engineer. Flight engineer is nice, but uh, it doesn't always work, especially when you have some of the crazier items in the interstellar mod. Uh, some of the, I mean, some of the numbers are just completely made up by the looks of things. Kerbal Engineer does have a hard job, so it's not surprising that it might not be particularly good at getting these Delta V numbers right all the time, especially when, when you guys come up with crazy ideas about staging. Anyway, escape burn is initiated, bringing the velocity up, and we have escaped into interplanetary space. Bring the perihelion down so that it will cross Kerbin's orbit, and then we will make some further corrections to make sure that we actually arrive at the Kerbal system and can aero break, or at the very least get captured. Honestly, I don't think I have enough Delta V in this thing to put myself into a stable orbit, especially since we'll be coming down from such, you know, such a long way away from the sun. We'll probably be flying back past at about three kilometers per second. Uh, maybe, maybe someone will actually care. Who knows, maybe by the time this data gets back, I will have the power of warp drive. But to be honest, I think we're going to have to fly our crew to some other locations first. I don't know. Anyway, moving on to another piece of debris. This, uh, well, this is the ultimate fate of my intended impactor for Duna. Well, um, yeah, unfortunately it undergoes another encounter with uh, Ike, and this one is sufficient to actually kick it out into interplanetary space. 
Alas, poor Impactor, you have failed to do your job. I have no idea. I am very ashamed. So yes, for future reference, if you're going to be using these things as, as uh, Impactors, fire them retrograde and they will uh, be more likely to actually impact. But yeah, let's uh, take one last look at Ike. Presumably there's some sort of automated systems on this still sending data back in a kind of dumb fashion all the way back to Kerbin. Maybe it's uh, like that space probe the Russians had where they could uh, listen to it, they could see what's going on, but they couldn't talk to it. Uh, that's, of course, the, the lizard sex space probe that was uh, the experiment. The lizard reproductive spacecraft <laughs> what's going on they had a, a biological payload and they were wanting to see if geckos would um well reproduce in zero g and then they would bring them back but uh yeah this thing is just going to head out into interplanetary space and you see it's actually going to get its orbit kicked up slightly higher than duna Okay, so now the Drez spacecraft, we uh, follow it into deep space, because from deep space, that's where we will actually perform our maneuver. We have a 900 meter per second burn that will make sure that we actually encounter Kerbin. And that will actually leave us with maybe a couple of hundred meters per second, which will not be enough to perform a capture. But it is Kerbin, so maybe we can perform an aero capture. Who knows? And of course, we go back to the debris from the Duna mission. It is going to disappear into interplanetary space. And once it's there, what I want to do is figure out whether it will impact again. So let's bring up the debris. There we go. And time accelerate our way out into deep space. See, I've got a lot of, uh, lot of things to keep track of right now. You know, all those counters or all those alarms are ticking away. And yes, delete on close. We don't care about that. Come on. Skip forward and wait for the wait for the nav ball to actually demonstrate this flip. Here we go. Wait for it. Wait for it. Come on. We want to see the nav ball flip. There we go. And we are now in interplanetary space. So now, what I can do is set up my. Uh, what I do is I put myself on rails. So I do ten times time acceleration. Then I create a maneuver node. Right, and what you can do is there's these two new buttons that get added in 0.23. And what they do is they make the maneuver node happen on future orbits. So you can actually set a maneuver node up in the distant future. And actually, I should be setting that as a target so I see how close I end up to Duna. Now, the maneuver node actually ha is a null maneuver node, which all it means is I can find out what happens, you know, years from now. And you can see that it will, in fact, miss Duna. And, uh, yeah, keep going around. Maybe it will arrive in 19 years' time. No. Okay, so this is never coming back to Duna as long as I can be bothered playing this. I'll need to come up with an alternative plan, I guess. Anyway, that planning will have to wait until after I've built my interplanetary spacecraft. We have... You know, we have deadlines to meet, launch windows and all that. We're, we're entirely stretched to the limit with our launch uh, schedule. Um, this is an external tank that will be strapped onto the rear of that interplanetary ship. And you can see that pretty much I did this completely lazy style, just strapping a bunch of chemical rockets around the outside. No fancy, you know, fusion, fission, antimatter, beamed power, none of that stuff. Not even the hint of an electrical engine. No, this is all traditional technology. And honestly, you know, that doesn't matter because it's just a cheap fuel tank that we're going to be strapping around to the exterior. It does look kind of cool, though, with those external engines pushing it up. Now, we're obviously trying to not use any fuel in the, the middle one, or at least we're trying to use the least amount of fuel. So what we do is we're trying to get into this 200 kilometer orbit, and you see the target there behind us. We get ourselves up to the to the correct altitude, and then we're going to make a burn that is going to leave the contents just inside the atmosphere, so that they eventually decay, and we can uh, well we can sacrifice these external fuel tanks to the to the god of rocketry, right? What is the god of rocketry called? I wonder. I'm sure somebody has come up with an appropriate mythology. Okay, so yeah, we uh, obviously point our spacecraft into orbit, or at least halfway into orbit, and we still have tons of fuel left. This was a terrible, terrible waste of fuel. But honestly, we're not caring about that, so we uh, time to ditch these things. 
bingo. And I didn't actually fire the solid rocket boosters on this. And they do te they are threatening to pincer in and grab my spacecraft, but just a quick burst of fuel and I move forwards out of their clutching grasp. No, they don't want to be sacrificed alone. They want to grab me and pull me back to Kerbin. But they will not be allowed to do that. This mission will not be allowed to stop. Not for those anthropomorphic external booster things. I don't know. I'm not really good at writing this stuff. I mean, I'm pretty sure that actually happens. That with spacecraft, you know, they detach something and then it fi they find that it's still attached for some reason, you know, by tr straps or something, and then the whole spacecraft falls back to Earth. I believe that has happened on more than one occasion. It hasn't generally taken the form of a giant hand grasping onto them, but that would be pretty cool if it did actually happen. Okay, so, yeah, these things are, well, they are going one way. They are going down into the atmosphere to be sacrificed to the god of rocketry once again. And, yeah, I like the way that thing oscillates back and forth. But, yeah, the, they will uh, no doubt have a nice warm welcome, so to speak. Anyway, after a couple of hours of synchronizing orbits, we find ourselves approaching the, the object in question. Now, this is going to be interesting because we have to dock these laterally, and that means aligning the docking ports in the correct way. And, of course, the docking ports probably aren't actually aligned because I just put them on randomly. I do have, if you look in the bottom right, I have servo control. So the docking ports in this spacecraft are on rotating disks, so I can rotate the docking port once I've actually docked. That's the plan. Of course, uh, right now I'm just trying to get in position, and that's involving a lot of shimmying, a lot of turning. We do have, uh, we have, you know, reaction wheels on this, which will, which helps us in the close maneuvering. There we go. 100 meters, 92 meters. 65, we're getting really close here. We don't want to break that radiation shield because I spent so much time making it look amazing. Okay, so this is the booster. It was just a rocket motor attached and I can detach it, make sure all the make sure I've got enough fuel in there. Off it goes. And then I will be able to ditch that into the atmosphere. Just need to turn the, the thing around a bit. And we go point retrograde and fire up the engines. And you know what? I'll just leave the engines burning. It's accelerating at about half a G. And it'll very quickly put it into the atmosphere. Meanwhile, I can switch back. Okay, so for docking, I'm gonna open up this port on the side. I figure I'll just take the one nearest me. I put ones on both sides just to balance it out. Now, I'm not gonna control it from here because I actually have a clue about what way I'm going. And as soon as I take control off it from there, um, all my rotation axes will flip 90 degrees and I will probably crash it into something. So let's uh, avoid the crashing until I'm sure that I'm moving slowly enough. Ah, there we go. Okay, so you see, lined that up and it looks like my uh, ports are actually out of alignment by about 90 degrees. That's okay because as long as we get it close enough here, you see it has a rotation pointer and it also has a rotation number 270.1 i want to get 270 obviously uh it'd be nice to actually see that reading after the docking happens to be honest so that i could try zeroing it out with a servo control but uh, i guess i'll just have to i'll just have to eyeball it honestly as long as the whole thing doesn't spin out of control i will be very happy so yes we're coming in to dock and well, this will actually be the last interstellar quest for a couple of weeks because I have to be in the UK for a cup for uh, weddings and things like that. But I'll be back. I will continue and I will hopefully have some footage for you. There we go. Docked and it looks pretty well. Uh, it's a little to the left there. We will fix that. But uh, in future episodes, until then, I am Scott Manley. Fly safe. Fly safe.